Bonjour, bonjour, and welcome to another episode of EveryoneHatesMarketers.com, the marketing podcast for marketers, founders, and tech people who are just sick of shady, aggressive marketing. I'm your host, Louis Grenier. Uh, in today's episode, you will learn how findings from psychology can be applied to advertising and how you can become a better marketer thanks to those findings. Uh, my guest today is the author of the really good book, uh, The Choice Factory, 25 Behavioral Biases That Influence What We Buy. He's the head of behavioral science for Manning Gottlieb, which I'm going to admit I didn't know about until I read more about you. But apparently it's the number one agency, advertising agency in Europe. So it's It's kind of a big deal, but he's doing that part time because the rest of the time he's freelancing, meaning he can say a lot of swear words <laughs> uh, during the podcast. So I'm super happy to have you on board, Richard Shotton. Let's see what you've got. Very nice to meet you. Looking forward to chatting. So let me tell you a little story. When I was 18 or 19, I went to visit my uh, my brother in Paris. Uh, my brother, being older than I am, uh, than I was, he was uh, reading a lot of books. And one of those books was a French book, and I'm going to say it in French, and then I'll try to translate, which uh, which was called Le Petit Traité de Manipulation à l'usage des honnêtes gens, which basically reads as uh, the little manual of manipulation for honest people. And basically a psychology book, and uh, basically behavioral science. So all the principles about foot in the door and all those basic yeah. behavioral you know, principles. And I fell in love with this book, and I also fell in love with marketing, Thanks to that read. And so that read led to reading more about marketing and basically led me to where I am today. So I'm quite happy to have a guest who knows all about behavioral science because this is really something I, I love talking about. And there's a good reason uh, for that, but I'm not going to say that now. Instead, I want you to say it. So why is it so important for marketers and people who are interested in marketing to understand how people think and how they behave? Okay. So I think there's three big reasons. The first is relevance. Everything we are trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis as marketers is persuade people. So we're trying to persuade them to buy our product more often, pay a premium, switch from a competitive brand. So frankly, what could be more relevant than the science, the study of why people make decisions? So I think the first big reason is, is relevance. The second big reason is range or variety. There's a really worrying trend in marketing at the moment that people are increasingly trying to find a single way of answering briefs. Now, because the problems that your listeners being fa will face or uh, different brand marketers face or owners face, because those problems are so varied, it's frankly ridiculous to try and have one solution. What you end up doing is force-fitting the problem you have at hand to the the tool that you believe in and you end up with the wrong approach. Can you give me an example on that before you go to the third well, point? Well, um, I would say something like brand purpose. Brand purpose, uh, this idea that has been first suggested in Stengel's Grow, that companies should have a, a, a higher order, a, a purpose beyond the profit, that would be one of those theories that it may be right in circum certain circumstances, but it's not right all the time. And if you, if you approach every brief with that as your key theory, I think you end up going wrong. Can you give me an example of like a company that went wrong with this purpose or an example of maybe not a, a real example, a fictional example of why you sh probably shouldn't use a purpose driven marketing campaign, for example? Yeah. So, so I mean, there are lots that ha have gone wrong. You, I'd argue in the UK, uh, McDonald's, where they try to um, create an ad all around the death of a boy's father and try and use, I think it was a fillet of fish as the way they could, they were, they were linked. Uh, there's obviously the very famous Pepsi example. But my, my attack on brand posts would never be on individual uh, case studies because I think there are always, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of brands in the world. There are always case studies you can find to support or dismiss a theory. Mm -hmm. What I would look at is more some of these larger, broader analyses like Stengel's Grow, which try and prove that there is a, a predictable value of using this. And those tend to be overblown. And it's the contrast with behavioral science is stark. Behavioral science isn't really one big grand theory. It's a collection of lots of biases, you know, and on, on occasion, you know, seemingly contradictory, messy biases. But the brilliance is that whatever brief you have, there will be a useful bias. But it does put the onus on the, the marketer. You know, it's not a 
simple tool which you can just apply randomly. You have to use your now. So you have to use your intelligence to pick the right bias for the particular problem you face. And then the third element of uh, why the third, yes, yeah, good important. point. I'd forgotten about the third. The third is uh, robustness. So again, another danger in um, uh, marketing. We've all been in these meetings where people defer to the most eloquent person in the room or more or normally the most highly paid person in the room. You know, that is not a good basis for making multi-million pound decisions, someone's gut feeling. What is far better is behavioral science, which is based on the peer-reviewed evidence of some of the leading scientists around the world, people like Kahneman and Thaler acting today, uh, B.F. Skinner and Alan Aronson in the past. And best of all, it's not a case of, you know, we just have to defer to these famous academics. All their research is in the public domain. We can take that research, we can rerun it and make sure it works for our particular brand in our particular market. So I'm going to ask a very leading question. And okay. I'm sure as a behavioral scientist, yeah. you'll appreciate it. Yeah. So do you think behavioral science would make marketers better, or at least practice like what I would call like the good marketing, so not the aggressive shady type? Yes, absolutely. Two reasons. Firstly, you've got that science behind it, that robustness. But secondly, and, and, and I think the strength of that is not that it will, you know, I've talked about there's this range that is, a, is relevant to all the different problems you face. It's not that taking a bias or psychological quirk from behavioral science will solve all your problems, but it will often give you a, a different angle to solving a, a problem. It gives you a different place to start. Um, and I think the second part is often those approaches can be really counterintuitive. They can allow you the luxury of considering things that I think just logic or rational thought alone might, might, might cause you to reject. So you and I had a brief email chat before going on to this, this interview, and I've asked you to basically pick out of the 25 behavioral facts uh, from your book to pick your favorite, your three favorites yeah, and yeah. drill down. So I'm very happy because the first one, I never heard of it and I feel ashamed, but I feel super interested as well. So I'm literally a beginner for this one, but I have a few examples right away that I read. But anyway, what we're going to do together for this episode, we're going to run through those three habits, uh, those yep. three um, behavioral biases. facts, yeah. Uh, yeah, biases. And we're going to try to not only look at the theory, uh, but also the practice. How can you actually use this bias at your advantage and uh, as a good marketer? And how can you be aware of it in the future? So. Excellent. Without further ado, yeah. what is the first of the three you'd like to talk about first? Okay, well, one I think that you mentioned is less well known is the pratfall effect, which is a, a fascinating one. So the pratfall effect was an idea that was first discussed by Elliot Aronson, so professor of psychology at Harvard in the 60s. And it's the idea that if you admit a weakness or you exhibit a flaw, you become more appealing. So it's quite a counterintuitive one. And what Aronson did in 1966 with his colleague, um, I think it was Floyd, Floyd and Willeman, his colleagues, he recruited someone to take part in a quiz. He gave that contestant the answers to the quiz. So the guy does amazingly well, gets 92% of the questions right and wins the quiz by miles. But then as the contestant is finishing, he makes what Americans will call a pratfall, a small blunder. He stands up and he spills a cup of coffee down himself. So Aronson takes that recording and he plays it to participants in his experiment in one of two ways. Either they hear the entire episode or they just hear the great quiz performance. And then Aronson asks everyone, how appealing do you find this guy? And people find the contestant, when they've heard the mistake, significantly more appealing. So as I said, Aronson calls this a pratfall effect and argues that people and products who exhibit a flaw become more appealing. So this is fascinating so many levels. I don't even know where to start at this mm, stage. Yeah, yeah. So there's a few things. First, I work for a company called Hotjar, and one of the core things that, that we are very proud of is the transparency. And so what we would do from time to time is publish a blog post with all the mistakes we've made in the last 12 months about a certain topic and what we learned from them. Or our CEO will go speak at conferences and, and meet Ooh, mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah and being very transparent about it, right? And that 
alone brought us a lot of brand equity. People really appreciated the fact that we would share stuff that yep. people wouldn't share. And that I feel very strongly that falls really into this effect, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And if uh, just a, a small aside, kind of relevant tangent. If you like that approach, I would recommend there's a paper by Paul Feldwick about Barclay Card. It's a hugely successful ad campaign in the 1980s. And what he says is, look, I hate all these award entries. They net, they, they, they're, they're a post-rationalized version of the truth. Here's what actually happened. And he mentions all the luck and the mistakes and the serendipity. And the other blog that regularly does that is a wonderful one called Stuff from the Loft by Dave Dye. So I think in marketing, they're the two ones that I think exhibit that, that brilliantly. And, and I think they work really well for a couple of reasons. I think if you exhibit, a, if, if you admit a flaw, so let's say as a brand, it's a VW. You know, they went out and said, ugly is only is skin deep. So they admit they're ugly. Listerine, the taste you hate twice a day, they admitted they tasted awful. Uh, Guinness, good things come to those who wait. They admit they were slow. Once you've admitted a flaw, it is, it's a tangible demonstration of your honesty and every, all your other claims become that much more believable. Now, considering one of the biggest issues we face as brands is that people, probably quite rightly, don't trust brands. That alone gets you, I think, a, a hell of a lot of benefits. So how can you, let's say, uh, uh, someone listening right now wondering, mm. how can I apply that to my daily job? Okay. They might yeah. not manage brands that are massive. Some of them do, but some of them don't. So why are, what can they start right now today to, you know, use this effect to their advantage and, and potentially bring more uh, people to them? So... You don't have to be a, a massive brand. One of the very well-studied areas by Northwestern University was about applying this uh, tactic on your reviews. So Northwestern University did so in 2015. They scraped 111,000 product reviews and they graphed them up showing the likely, so the, 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 the number of the review, the kind of rating of the review from one to five, five being brilliant, one being awful, and then the likelihood to purchase. And what they found was that for every one of the 22 categories they looked at, as the product review gets better, likelihood to purchase increases until it hits a tipping point. So somewhere between 4.2 and 4.4 out of 5. And then after that point, if the review gets any better, then likelihood to purchase declines. So they argued perfection was not trusted. It was seen as too good to be true. So consumers didn't trust perfection. So if you are running a brand, whatever size, if you have negative reviews, don't be ashamed of them. You know, don't be one of these websites that just put up the perfect reviews. Put some of the poor ones up and explain, you know, answer them, explain why maybe they had a poor service in that very rare individual case. It also reminds me of, of a book about leadership. I think the 22 irrefutable laws of leadership, uh, mm. or maybe I'm missing it up, but I remember reading about this concept in leadership that it's, if you want to be a good leader, you also need to be showing like your weaknesses and being able to admit them, right? Yeah. Because paradoxically, you don't come across as weak. You come across as strong. There's a lovely study. I don't mention this in the book. I think I might have read it afterwards, um, called the red sneaker effect. And it's by, I think it's either Francesca or Francesco Gino. And what the psychologist did was go to academic conferences in the early 2000s when there was a very strong norm for wearing formal clothes. So most people would wear suit and a shirt. What Gino did was categorize how well-dressed they were from formal to informal. And then once he'd done that, categorized individuals, he would go and ask them how many citations they had. So citations are a good quantitative measure of how successful you are as an academic. And what he found is there was an inverse correlation between formality of dress and number of citations. So what he then argued is this idea called the red sneaker effect, which is essentially it is only people who have a high status or a confident in their abilities that can break a norm. One of the biggest norms you have is pretending to be perfect. So the argument from, from that would be, you know, don't try and hide your flaws. If you tell people about them, if you admit a weakness, people will find you more appealing and a higher status probably. Well, one thing that I do 
obviously i don't have a choice my accent yeah. my accent is my accent right yeah but yeah, one yeah. thing that i play on now is i've decided a few years ago you know i'm not going to try to remove it i'm just going to try to make sure mm. that people understand me uh yes. a bit like Schwarzenegger. i mean he's been living in the us for like 40 50 years at this stage but yeah. And I've understood it's, now that admitting that, yeah, I do have a French accent and I'm not going to remove it actually is something that, uh, that is kind of a sort of a weakness. Cause yeah, I could be, I could be a podcaster with like the perfect American accent, like yeah, everyone else, yeah. but I'm more than happy with my oh, French one. And, and, and the other bit there, cause I you think know, debatable, I would not argue a French accent was a weakness, there you go. but what it probably that's is, it. is distinctive. And that's the other massive benefit of the pratfall effect that all your competition will be going out and bragging. So the great thing is, if you go out and admit a flaw, you become distinctive. And if there's one thing we know about advertising, it's that what is distinctive is, it is memorable. Now, so I, saw, um, I saw a great uh, example of this in the, in, the, in the pub a few days ago. So I went to a BrewDog pub, and on the back of their T-shirts, they have comments from customers who came in and thought the uh, you know overpriced tosh or tasted awful you know they've got comments from people who hated their product and to me that shows an amazing confidence in what you have you don't you're not trying to appeal to everyone and the other bit is could you ever imagine you know an industrialized lager like molson cores or fosters or or whoever making that same same call it's uh, it's amazing it's really amazing to see that it also connects very well with the fact that when you take risk, when you show who you are, you said very well that you don't appeal to anyone anymore. And I think mm. one of the key reasons for marketing, like to be successful is to make sure that you don't appeal to any, everyone because then you appeal to no one, right? So admitting your flaws and also you will probably, there will probably some people that won't like that, but the ones who will, will probably love it more and therefore be a promoter of your business and be more willing to buy from you. Absolutely. I think that that's a, yeah, it's, it's a potentially great advantage. And there's some lovely ones. I saw a American uh, ski resort where they had taken a bad customer review and put it on the, um, their double page ad. And it was something along the lines of, I think it was called Snowbird, um, Greg from California. And he's, he, what he'd written was, you know, these slopes are frankly dangerous. People should not be allowed on them. And they ran that and said, look, you know, it's not for everyone. This is, you know, for the hardcore skier. So I could talk about the, the platform effect for, for ages with you, but we have two other uh, biases to go through. And I'm yep. mindful of your time as well. And I know that listeners are eager to know the two others. So uh, I think we've cornered this one pretty well. I think people are quite convinced now they should probably try it out a bit more and making their mistakes a bit more. And that's very beneficial. So now what's the second bias you'd like uh, to go through? So the second bias is confirmation bias. And it's the idea that people are very good at maintaining their existing point of view. So, for example, if you dislike a brand and you hear a message to them, your brain can generate counter-argument after counter-argument, which maintains that uh, its existing point of view. It just doesn't agree with the, the, the new information. Now, what's interesting here is that behavioral science just doesn't identify a problem. It also identifies the solution. So there's a wonderful uh, Stanford psychologist called Festinger. And what Festinger did was look at moments when people were more open to persuasion, more open to changing their point of view about an, a, a, a deeply held belief. So what he does in 1964, he recruits people. Uh, who are members of college fraternities, and he plays them an audio argument, an audio argument why college fraternities are morally wrong. Now, half of them just listen to the uh, audio argument. The other half also listen to a silent film, or sorry, have to watch a silent film. Then after they've done this, they answer questions about how much their beliefs have changed. And what Festinger found was that if people were also watching the silent film, they were more likely to have changed their views. Now, this is, I think, a fascinating experiment because the argument would be, look, if you want to persuade someone who dislikes your brand that it's actually decent, what you shouldn't do is the strategy that 99.9% .9 of media planners would advise you to do, which is put your ad in a high attention environment. 
know, things like the cinema or a, a point of view programming. What Festinger argument argues is if you do that, you know, you're just drawing, you, you, the brain will just create these counter arguments and nothing will change. What you should do is reach people at moments of distraction because at least they're potentially persuadable. So it might be you run on an auxiliary medium that people are doing something else while they're listening to, like radio. Or you forget about the media argument and you take this as a, a creative suggestion. And therefore, for creative, um, what you should consider is not making just factual arguments. You know, don't just list a long group of reasons about why your brand's great. What you need to do is think about the body language and the tone of your ads. And perhaps the best example of this is back in the late 80s, British Airways were struggling with perceptions of quality. What they didn't just do was talk about how they had amazing stewards and stewardesses, great big seats. What they did was always accompany their ads with Dalib's flower duet, you know, this wonderful, evocative piece of classical music. Now, there is no logical argument about quality, so therefore the brain isn't that doesn't come up with a list of counter arguments. So I think that's a, yeah, an interesting one. It brings me straight away. I wanted to talk mm. about that because at, as soon as you mentioned this, I thought of Facebook and their recent shit show of an event. Like it's just insanely, it's insane to me that these billion, multi-billion dollar companies have failed so badly at communicating about their flaws and failed so badly as understanding the exact principle you just mentioned. So I'm talking about the privacy issues, the fact that they had so many security breaches and the yeah. way they communicated about it was not in moment of distraction whatsoever. I feel they've just blasted their message of saying, yeah, we're sorry, we fucked up, but we didn't really fuck up uh, to everywhere they could, right? Yeah, yeah. How, like, how would you have approached this strategy? Uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe they did it well. I mean, so well, there, are two, there are two things there. There is the first point, which I think is fascinating about the first scandal with Facebook was around the, the, the Russian advertising, the American elections. I would actually hold a slightly different viewpoint about that. And unfortunately, I think, well, which way you argue, I think from that, the biggest beneficiary will actually be Facebook. There's a lovely analogy back in the, oh God, I'd say 1920s, but I might be getting my decades wrong of doing the story about Orson Welles and War of the Worlds. He did a, a program about H.G. Wells's novel, War of the Worlds, and he ran it as a, he made it look like it was a, a news program. So supposedly, all the newspapers, supposedly there had been riots that people got so scared about this story of uh, alien invasion that was said to a news story that they panicked in the streets. Yeah. Has so you heard of that one? No, I remember. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So what, what, what's interesting is that when people have looked into this since, you know, there was no panic. You know, there's no evidence of any of these panics. It was a story concocted by the newspapers of the day to try and crush an embryonic medium. I actually think what's happened with the Russian election story is the same thing has happened. You see traditional news organizations repeatedly talking about how Facebook swung the US election. Now, I've no idea about the, the rights and the wrongs of this, but what it certainly seems is that many of those new organizations are jumping on this a chance to tarnish Facebook. What's fascinating, though, is if you go back to the 1920s, what happened with uh, radio and Orson Welles? Those newspapers tried to make a scandalous event. It caused a massive hoo-ha for a few months. But after those few months died down, after the, the, the kind of news story died down, what advertisers were left with was the memory that radio was an amazingly powerful medium, that it had the ability to cause panic in the streets, and therefore it could probably sell their dishwasher powder. I think exactly the same mistake is being made by news brands and Facebook. They've gone out and told everyone that it's this amazingly powerful medium that is swinging elections. Once the hoo-ha has died down, what advertisers will remember is that it can swing elections and therefore it will shift their yogurts and soap powders. So unfortunately, it depends which argument side you want to go for, but unfortunately for the newspapers, I think they are digging their own graves by following that tactic. Yeah, you just showed with your argument that you're much smarter than me and shouldn't attempt to 
to uh, to talk about behavioral science too much. Well, I'm not sure if that has anything to do with behavioral science, but I love it as a. Uh, I just love the Orson Welles uh, uh, story. It's one of, my, one of my favorites. It's about the same. Uh, I interviewed Mark Ritson a few year, a few months ago uh, about the about brand, and and he was dismissing this 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 uh, busting this myth about the fact that oh your reputation as a brand can be destroyed in one second. It takes only one Ooh, thing. Yes, yes. And he was making the point that that's completely bullshit. Giving the example of Volkswagen, for example, yeah, had a yeah. massive scandal, oh, and yet, oh my lord, yeah, and yet they're still selling and they're still going well. So I think that connects with your point, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I love listening to Mark Ritson. I think he's uh, you know, brilliant to listen to. And I, the data backs his point up exactly that YouGov do a uh, brand index, a poll of various different branding measures after the emissions scandal. VW's scores plummet. Within a few weeks, they're gradually building back up again. You know, I don't think they've quite hit the same branding scores as they were at, but it's 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 it's, it's kind of marginal now. So even in that huge scandal probably because they'd had 50 years of amazing advertising, I think they were given a second chance because they had a really strong brand. In other instances where people haven't had such a strong brand, it's been a bit more commoditized, they've traded on price. Uh, things like Ratners, I mean, Ratners literally did destroy itself almost overnight. Uh, uh, what happened? So it was a family jewelry. It started off as a family jewelry that grew to be a really big chain of jewelers in the UK. And Gerald Ratner, I think his name was, who was the founder, owner, at a, like a, a fancy big wigs dinner, said, you know, his products were crap, basically. So it was, you know, cheap crap. They had a massive margin on. And one of the journalists at the back couldn't believe that this guy was saying it. So next day, printed this in full, and he destroyed his, you know, family brand very, very quickly. But I still don't think that necessarily contradicts Mark Ritson's point. It was that I don't think... Ratners hadn't had that great investment in, in in advertising, in building any any sort of brand warmth. So therefore, when that problem came along, they, they, they saw horrendous difficulties from it. Interestingly, people sometimes say, look, isn't that a contradiction to what you just said about the pratfall effect? But with all these biases, there's lots of nuances. And there's a couple which are relevant there, which is the pratfall effect. Some of Aronson's work showed that it only works if you've already got a degree of competency. If you... If you Admit a flaw and you're already seen as a bit shoddy, it makes it worse. And then secondly, don't just pick a weakness randomly. The, you know, the quality of your product is your core competence. The best brands don't uh, admit a weakness around their core competence. They admit something not only that isn't core, but also has a, a positive mirror image. You know, so think of Guinness. They don't say their beer tastes awful. Mm -hmm. They say it's slow. And actually, well what people know through bitter experience is if it takes time uh, to make, it's probably higher quality. So, so it's a weakness that has a mirror strength. And I would say the third point is actually, oh, yeah. if you have to admit a mistake after someone else proved that it was a mistake, then, then that doesn't work, right? You can't, as Facebook or, or, or Volkswagen, you can't say after the fact, well, yeah, we fucked up, but it's much better if you say, that you fucked up from the start, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm certainly not sure if it's the pratfall effect if you are caught uh, out. When I think you're absolutely right, Ratner was caught you know, slagging off his customers. The only instance I've seen recently, but well, not the only instance, but one of the recent instances I've seen brilliantly of dealing with a, a problem is probably things like KFC, where you don't hide in weaselly language. You make a mistake, and I think you are completely forthright about it. So... You know, they turned KFC into FCK, and I think that was a, a very smart, smart move. <laughs> For, uh, I just got it. I just understood. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. For listeners, the FCK, you add the U between the F and the C, and, and yes. there you go. British customers would get there very quickly because yeah. French connection for a while was FC UK. That's true. Yeah. So how can people apply this confirmation bias in their day-to-day, -day, like in practical terms? How, what would you advise people to do then? Pretty, as always, there's always three things. We've touched two of them, which is maybe targeting moments of distraction in your creative thinking about associations rather than direct arguments. I, I'm interested in the third point, though, which is it might lead you to a targeting approach. And the targeting approach might be this one of triage. So break your customer, break a potential target audience into three. You've got detractors, dislikers of the brand, broadly ambivalent, and let's call them loyal 
I know fans is a bit extreme, but you know, know where I'm going with that one. This argument around confirmation bias would say you should focus resolutely on the middle group. You should say, look, confirmation bias exists. It's hard to get around. There are tactics we've talked about, but frankly, ignore the detractors because it's a hard thing to do and you'll probably spend a lot of money and make little difference. Similarly, I think there's a, or, or, or there's also an argument that you should ignore the people who really like your brand because if they're regular buyers, there isn't much headroom and most of the information or feelings they'll get about your brand will come from product usage and experience. Therefore, target people who are either lapsed, light, or ambivalent towards your brand. So the, the, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a targeting angle that comes from confirmation bias as well. And I kind of enjoy it because it's an admission of the weak power of advertising. You know, on an individual basis, advertising has quite a weak effect. You know, yes, because it goes out to millions of people, it aggregates up to a big effect, but maybe sometimes we should have less grandiose objections, uh, objectives, you know, ignore and sod brand love. I think it's far more realistic to get people to buy a little bit more often or return to a brand a little bit quicker than they may have done. And can you talk just a bit more in details about what you just briefly mentioned that I think is very powerful instead of going uh, heads on in an argument like using the association. So what do you mean exactly here? Oh, sorry. Uh, so this is, um, oh, no, I should say is Robert Heath talks about this brilliantly in seducing the subconscious. And that's where I got that argument from. You know, Festinger's, art, Festinger's initial uh, kind of central idea is, look, the brain is brilliant at coming up at counter arguments if you approach it directly, if you make a logical assault on its existing beliefs. So instead of giving logical, rational reasons about why someone should change their behavior, what you do is surround yourself with kind of associations. You make an oblique approach. And in the case of BA, the oblique approach was by always using classical music, there are very strong associations with quality in classical music. Therefore, it conveyed you were a high quality, a premium brand, a luxurious brand. Because you never state it, you don't generate all these, these counter arguments. How can you find those associations? Because like that's classical music that brings, uh, like, that gives this feeling of, yeah, like uh, excellence and all of that. That's obvious now that you say it, but in, in hindsight, I would never have thought of that. So how do you... How do you find those associations? Like what typical methods would you use? Yeah, I mean, the other way, costly signaling could be one other argument around this area that the value of a massive sponsorship or a 90 second TV ad or a seemingly frivolous double page spread, you could argue the associations there are very much around a perceived expense of the advertising. And there's a number of academics, economists, people like John Kay, uh, and Evan Davis, I think, who have argued that advertising works because of its perceived expense. You know, people think, well, only a brand, when they see an expensive ad or advertising in general, they think only a brand who had confidence in their products would bother to advertise for the long term because they won't recoup the benefit quickly or take a long time. And that is particularly extreme with high expense advertising. So one way to convey quality, genuine belief in your brand is to invest in those approaches that are perceived to be extravagant. In the long term as well, right? Like yeah, the more, yes, yeah. The it's more a screening you mechanism. Add. Only someone with genuine, strong faith in the long term robustness of their brand that people are going to come back again and again and again would advertise in that way. And because it acts as a screening mechanism, the only type of brands that do those things exhibit those characteristics right let's go through the last uh, biases of the day because i'm mindful that i'd like to go into it in detail as well so what is the third one so the third one is habit or, or kind of more specifically what are the moments when people's habits become destabilized and therefore as an advertiser you can persuade them because there's an argument that you know, there's a huge amount of complexity in life one of the ways that consumers get around that is just to buy the last thing they, they bought. That's one tactic. Now, that's a problem for lots of brands because how do you persuade someone to buy your products or encourage them to buy your products? Persuade a bit too strong, maybe, when they're not even considering it. Now, one of the tactics that I've investigated with a colleague called Laura Weston is 
how people's habits become destabilized just after they undergo a life event. So what I mean by that, uh, life event is you know, getting married, divorced, retired, moving house. And the research we did was we got 2,370 people and we asked them two questions. First one was, uh, which of these life events have you undergone in the last six months, 12 months? Tick the ones that apply. And then the second question was, uh, well, actually, we, we asked some filler questions in between to throw people off the scent. And then the final question was, in which of these categories have you tried a new brand? Tick the ones that apply. Uh, and we did it a few different ways. We also asked kind of favorite brand and uh, where have you changed, you tried a new brand or got a favorite, new favorite brand. And what we found was that on pretty much every life event and every product we looked at, people were between two and three times more likely to try a new brand in that short window after they had undergone a life event. One thing I'm, I'm thinking about straight away, uh, sorry to cut you there, is the uh, when I go on holidays yeah. or when I go yeah, away oh, yeah, to yes. France, st I know that I'm very susceptible to change because I know when I come back, my habits are distorted and I would yes. be, I have more uh, tendency to buy new stuff. Yeah. Do you know what? I, that, is a, that is a brilliant one. I've never researched that. But, you know, the, the great thing about doing life events is we've got this proof that people's habits are destabilized. They become more open stuff. But some of those life events are pretty rare. You know, it's, it's practical to target them. Lots of digital data providers have that data. You know, Facebook track when you, what, your relationship status. But the interesting thing, I think, about holiday is that it's a far more regular thing. So, yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a fascinating one to research. There you go. Let's do it together. Yeah, yeah. well, so that'll, be in the, that'll be in the second book. Yeah. There you go. The 25 <laughs> other biases you should yes. know about. Oh, yeah. The 25 biases that didn't make it in the first book <laughs> yeah. will be the subtitle. Yeah. <laughs> and admitting that you fucked up, you should have added the 25 in the first book. <laughs> yeah. But apart from those, those examples you show, what are some practical ways... Uh, one can can use this. So you, you mentioned something briefly in Facebook. You can know whether like somebody becomes single and stuff. It's nice from an advertiser point of view, from a person point of view. I feel it. I feel it's a bit shady. I I, I mean I'm not a big fan of this type of targeting. I think it's very yeah I, I, a bit the gray hat. So let's try to find an example that is less gray hat, right? A bit more white hat, a bit more good marketing uh, style. So how else could you? Take advantage of this. I think there's probably three applications. This the, 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 the central idea is changing people's behaviour is very hard. So you want to pinpoint these moments of um, flux. Now you know it could be these life events. The second one could be doing it before habits harden. There's some lovely experiments by a guy called um, I think it's David Olds, and he analysed some of the some governmental communications and what he investigated was called the nurse family partnership where they identified families who were um who were perceived to be uh, at risk or the children perceived to be at risk and they spent a lot of money um trying to make an intervention so they would get nurses to go around very regularly and it was one of the famous uh, kind of public health campaigns that had a huge return a positive return but when they analyzed the data they found that it was people, all the effect was people having their first child. There was a massive effect amongst people who had their first child. When they were having their second or third child, it had no impact at all. So people were, again, they felt they knew what to do and therefore were impervious to messages. So the second bit there would be about putting a disproportionate influence on people when they are entering your category when they have limited experience of I don't know buying holidays getting bank accounts that is the moment or you know eating healthily when you're starting to make kind of food decisions for the, you know cooking for your first time yourself another one I I'm thinking about sorry to cut you again but um, the other one that I'm thinking about is the changing job right that could be very powerful as well. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, if you go back to the life events, I mean, it's not, yeah, not just um, relationship status. Yeah, changing jobs is a hugely important one. Uh, moving house, uh, starting university. You know, these are all moments of uh, retiring when uh, habits are in flux. So I think, you know, I think you're right, though, to, you know, to sound on a note of caution. On one hand, these are very tailored moments to get someone actually to the point of action. But with all these things, if you take them too far, there are huge implications. There's a wonderful argument from a guy called Kevin Simler about the dangers of kind of personalized and targeted advertising. 
what Similar argues, and he uses this lovely analogy of beer, he says the value of a brand is in its kind of shared cultural meaning. So he takes an example. I think he might use Red Stripe. He says, look, Red Stripe has a value because if I go to a party and I want to suggest I'm laid back, I bring Red Stripe. We all know what it means, and it helps in me project my identity. However, if that beer brand gets greedy and tells me that it's laid back, you that it's all about its high quality provenance, someone else that it's a, uh, a beer that sponsors comedy, if it tries to target different messages to different people, you know, to begin with, that will look amazing and have a great effect. But sooner or later, we will overhear those messages and it's and therefore we'll know that it stands for nothing or that it can stand for many different things. So its value as a signal to other people about what we believe in no longer stands. This is very tricky, right? I mean, for marketers oh. are probably like, it makes me think already in terms of, you know, those personalization software allowing you mm. to change your landing pages based on behavior. And yes, it all makes sense in the short term. But when yes. we think of the long term brand building exercise, that makes complete sense. And actually, we have a lot of back and forth with my CEO uh, of Hodja when we talk about yeah. uh, the brand. And, and he makes always a good point about, no, let's we know who our ideal customers are. Let's build the right product for them. But let's not antagonize the others too much or, or tailor something different to others because exactly of this reason. I mean, he's not mentioning all of the data and the fact and science yeah. behind it. But in terms of the thinking, I think this is what he has in mind always. is like making sure that you don't dilute your message your yes. core value proposition and you, so that's you, tricky yeah. right yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you know that's suppose that's the you know that is i suppose the art i think it's got to accept that if you just look at things in the short term you will optimize to a suboptimal position you will as you say optimize the short term but then over time you will you will be creating problems so yes apply some of these moments of personalization but don't do it to such a degree or, um, that you lose kind of what the essence of your brand is, because then you're going to be, that's a serious problem over, coming over the horizon. So Richard, you've been mm. absolute pleasure. Uh, thanks so, so much oh, for going sure through so. all of those, uh, all of those biases with me. I have three other questions I always okay. ask at the end of the podcast uh, that I'd like you to answer. So the first one being, what do you think marketers should learn today? Uh, and I think I know the answer. Uh, yeah. What do you think marketers should learn today that will help them in the next 5, 10, 50 years? I love that question. I am a big advocate for the idea that people don't essentially change. There's this wonderful Birnbach quote of, and I'm not sure about his kind of uh, historical knowledge, but, you know, the guy was a creative genius. But essentially, he, he says, uh, it's taken millions of years for human nature to evolve, it'll take millions of years before it even varies. It's fashionable for communicators to talk about the changing man. Uh, sorry, it's fashionable to talk about the changing man, but we should be concerned as communicators about the unchanging man. So my strong belief is we should be focusing more on the fundamentals of marketing. We should be focusing on how people make decisions. So, and that that's learning from psychology and behavioral science, not on the flavor of the month that seems to take up far too much of people's time and effort. I'm so happy you answered that. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I've been following your LinkedIn since we got in touch and you're sharing oh. a lot of uh, a lot of facts like this and I've been sharing a few actually and uh, people like that. And that this is something that I try to repeat over and over on this podcast is that as you said and I, I don't want to re just repeat what you said but basically yes, people don't change. Technology do change but we don't change. Um, we, we adapt to certain new circumstances, but the way we think, the way it's ingrained in our DNA is not going to change. So this is why growth hacking, I don't know if you heard that, like growth hacking and those kind of short term thinking, flavor of the month marketing, I, I just can't stick it because it, it just makes you think that there is something new under the sun every, every yeah. day. It's not the case. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I wonder there, you know, maybe it's an ego thing. There's a lovely argument from Anatomy of Humbug by Paul Felwick that I think he says, look, we all want to think that we're at the hardest time for marketers because it makes us feel so important. But frankly, it's always been tough. And the reason I love the folks on psychology is if you learn this stuff, when you retire, on the day you retire, it will be just as relevant. If you learn about some uh, fad that's you know, fleetingly of interest, well, you've got to relearn a whole new load of stuff in five years' time. There's, 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 there's great rewards, I think, to learn about psychology and behavioral science. What are the top three resources you would recommend our listeners? Could be a book, could be a podcast, could be an event, anything. So in terms of books, I am a big fan of Decoded 
by Phil Baden, uh, Phil Baden, which is another book about behavioral science. And he's very good at applying the, uh, making the leaps about how Marx should apply it. I'm a big fan of anything Rory Sutherland does. You know, whether it's his book, The Wiki Man, it's his spectator columns, it's his TED Talks, because he is frankly a genius. He's a wonderful left field imagination. He'll take the same biases, same psychological insights that we can all read about, but his mind is so fertile, he'll leap off in complete different directions. And then the third one, uh, another book that I've read quite reasonably recently is Everybody Lies by Seth Stevens Davidovitz. So he's an ex-Google data scientist, and it's a wonderful argument with some brilliant, brilliant examples about how if you ask people why they behave the way they do, they will give you misleading answers. And he is a huge advocate for looking at the terms they use when they're searching. He compares Google to a 21st century confessional that you can see what people think when they think no one's watching. You've been too nice not to mention your book. So the choice... Or a bad salesman, which should make you <laughs> yeah. question anything I don't for say yeah. about sales. But the fact do. that you admit that you're being a bad salesman makes you feel even better. So the, the choice factory, 25 behavioral biases that influence what we buy. I haven't bought it yet. I will. I promise. I uh, definitely Public recommend... Commitment. Absolutely. Yeah. Public commitment. There you yeah. go. So I have to do it now. Uh, I absolutely recommend every listener to, to buy it as well. Based on the small conversation we had together and this interview, like I, I know that people will get a lot of value from it. Uh, and I'm much. super impressed by the among the number of followers you have on LinkedIn. I don't give a shit about numbers normally, but that just threw me off. It's like 200,000 people. How did that happen? Uh, it, it's quite weird as well because I, I, I absolutely uh, love Twitter and use it loads. I uh, don't use LinkedIn, LinkedIn as but much. Nobody but... follows your link on Twitter. <laughs> no, nobody. Not compared to that so now. switch to LinkedIn. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I normally just tend to post um, uh, articles I've written. And then what I've started doing recently is if I see something interesting in a book, I will take a photo of it uh, and post it on LinkedIn. And when I say a book, not a not a novel, not a crime fiction book, uh, anything around psychology or advertising. Yeah, I think uh, people have guessed that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So last time I read the novel was about three years ago. So uh, uh, apart from apart from LinkedIn and Twitter, where can listeners connect with you? Those are probably the best two places, or they can always send me an email, rshotton189 at gmail.com. But uh, Frank, no, actually Twitter's, uh, Twitter, Twitter's probably the best place, because I think uh, people can, eat, I leave my um, messages on so people can DM me. So what's your Twitter handle? At R Shotton, S-H-O-T-T-O-N. Brilliant. Well, Richard, once again, it's been an absolute pleasure. I could talk to you for hours. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. That's it for another episode of everyonehatesmarketers.com. And this is the moment where I tell you to subscribe to our email list. So before you leave and go to another podcast or listen to another episode, I don't treat email list uh, the way people usually treat their email list. I really treat that as a, as a one-to-one conversation. So I'm going to send you very short and personal emails every two weeks, I would say. We, I'll inform you of guests in advance. I'll share with you my numbers and how many listens we get. And I'll also ask you for your feedback in terms of the questions we can ask future guests. And perhaps I can also... Uh, have you on the show uh, someday so don't be afraid to subscribe I'm not going to spam you and you can always unsubscribe for sure if you wish the second thing we need from you is your harsh and honest feedback we know that this show is not perfect yet and we always uh, can improve so you can send us your email at feedback at everyonehatesmarketers.com good or bad please feel free to send me an email and the last thing I like uh, from you is that if you did like the episode please share it to your friends your colleagues or whoever might like it and also please review it on itunes or another service that you might use to listen to your podcast because if you leave us a five-star review it means that more people would be likely to listen and we can spread the word quicker so thank you so much once again and au revoir